I will start talking because I have loads and loads of things that I want to talk about today. Um, this is really going to be a very methods focused talk. I want to go very, very rapidly over some of the types of approaches that we're using in my lab to get neuroimaging outside into the real world. And I'm not really going to talk about cognition very much at all, but I just want to say these are some of the things that the technologies can do and also some of the methods challenges that, that we face in trying to use these new kinds of technologies. Um, so I was trained in fMRI, the kind of classic cognitive experiment where you put a person in a scanner and they lie still and they watch little stimuli and we can see lots of brain activity, but that's very, very constrained. Often you know, your only motor options are two response keys. You have to keep your head still. Um, and things. Now my lab is using FNAS, Functional Neuroinfluence Spectroscopy, which means that we can suddenly get outside all of these constraints of an MRI scanner and go out into the street, into the real world, into social interactions. Um, and that suddenly opens up a whole lot of new challenges of what actually should we be studying? What kind of experimental design do we use when we're no longer constrained to you know, simple events and what kind of analyses and things do we use to look at that. So um, I'm going to start off with a very rapid introduction to FNAS. I wasn't terribly sure if other people were going to talk about this already today, um, but just so that everyone is on board with the basic principles of this, FNAS uses infrared light um, and you have sources of infrared light. The light can go through skin, it can go through bone, it can get down to the surface of the cortex. The light that gets down to the cortex will be scattered. It's typically scattered along this banana-shaped path and gets picked up as a detector. Um, the amount the light is scattered will depend on the absorption of the tissue just here in this bit of cortex. And that will depend on things like the amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in that part bit of the cortex. So if we send in different wavelengths of light, then there's different absorption curves for the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So we can get nice measures of that. This is a measure from my primary visual cortex. And the black dark bit here is seeing lots of flashing lights. And the pale bit is when it's not seeing anything. So you see a nice clear response. It looks very, very similar to the fMRI signal because we're measuring the same stuff as you measure in an MRI scanner. You're measuring this change in blood flow in the cortex. And we typically get an increase in oxygenated blood and a decrease in deoxygenated blood when you turn on the visual stimulation. So the signals we're getting at look just like MRI. We can analyze them with many of the same principles that we use for MRI. We can relate it very closely to what we already know about brain function from MRI studies. But we've got a whole lot of different options in terms of the types of experiments, the types of participants that we work with. Um, we don't just want to do FNERS as a cheaper version of MRI. The kind of cases where this technology is really, really valuable are the cases where you want to do things that don't fit into an MRI scanner. So there's a lot of work with children and infants. Um, I'm going to tell you about some work where we're doing outdoor tasks, walking around in Queen Square, walking around in the streets of London. Um, it's very useful in low resource settings where you might not have access. I have some colleagues here at UCL who are doing studies of infant development and children in the Gambia, and they'll be putting their ethnos on the back of pickups and driving out to villages and collecting brain imaging data. Um, it's useful often with many, many patient groups who may be unable to go into an MRI scanner, people with cochlear implants, people with um, movement disorders or mental health conditions that mean that they can't go in a scanner. Um, and then it's very, very interesting. And again, I'll tell you a bit about some data looking at social interactions where you've got two or more groups of people who can actually move about and engage with each other in a natural way. And we can still collect some brain imaging data um, in that context. So um, because I want to rush through some methods today, and I know I've only got a short time, I'll tell you about three different studies that kind of highlight some different things. First, a study of um, playing a card game, a bit like poker, where we look at lying and lie detection and a face-to-face -face interaction. Then a study of prospective memory, where we're going to get out of the lab and onto the street. And finally, a study where um, we're looking at actors performing Shakespeare on stage in the theatre, just because we want to try and push the technology to the absolute limit of what it can do and see if, if it's still possible to get meaningful data in that context. Um, so our first study is looking at lying and lie detection. 
This has been done lots and lots of times in MRI with things like guilty knowledge tests. Um, there's a nice one with a sort of dice game where you want to strategically lie to other people. Um, but just asking someone in the scanner to press a button of have you seen this card before doesn't bear much relation to a more meaningful context where people lie. Well, often the context like police interviews or again games of poker are th things that happen face to face. And one of the things that's challenging in those situations if someone wants to lie is to control what their face is doing, to control all these little non-verbal behaviours. Um, so by using FNAS, we can record from prefrontal cortex of two participants who are face to face and they're playing a card game which allows them to lie or tell the truth. So on each round of the game, there'll be an informant and a guesser. Um, so the informant will look at their card and can say either mine is higher or lower. And then the guesser has to decide if they're lying or telling the truth. So we've got a nice two by two factorial design of the trials where they're actually playing the game. And then some control trials where, for example, if the two cards are the same or they're the highest card or lowest card, we can force people to tell the truth or force them to lie. Um, we had 35 pairs of participants do this task and we're going to say just is there prefrontal cortex activation when you're lying? Is there activation, for example, if you're telling the truth but with the intent to deceive the other person? So is this about your intent to tell a lie or is it about whether you're actually saying the word that's on the card or not? Um, and I'll just show a couple of the contrasts here. If we look at just telling a lie, so the force any trials with a lie compared to any trials with truth, we get some nice big activations in the prefrontal cortex. And also if you're telling the truth with the intention to deceive, again, we get some nice big activations across prefrontal cortex. We're analyzing the data here with a pretty classic trial-based design, just like you would do um, in an MRI study. But the nice thing is we can see this in both people at once and we can see it um, in the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so, just to summarize what I've shown here is just how we can get data um, with ethnas in um, this face-to-face -face context. We can see that lying in the face-to-face -face interaction engages some of these medial areas of prefrontal cortex. It's not just the dorsolateral areas that sometimes come up in the trad MRI studies. Um, and um, so I think the future question that leads on from this is in this study, we didn't, we had video footage just of a sort of side on view of the participants to know when people were moving cards about and things, but we didn't have detailed face capture of them, facial expressions and micro expressions. That's something that I think is gonna be really, really important in this and really important in um, future studies. We've got another study with a different, more controlled task where we do start to get at the facial expressions, but this idea of linking these micro, these little gestures, little um, social behaviors up to what's happening in the brain imaging data, I think is going to be something that's going to be very, very important for future studies that are doing hyperscanning analyses and using FNERS to look at um, social interactions as well. So there's some other references to that there. Um, the second of the studies I want to tell you about today is looking at um, prospective memory. So prospective memory is the idea of remembering something that you're going to do in the future. It's about intentions. Um, and it's very, very easy to do. When I leave work, I think, oh, I've got to remember to buy milk on the way home. But 15 minutes later, I get off the train and walk straight past the corner shop. And it isn't until I open the front door. I go, ah, darn, I forgot the milk. Um, and so um, this is something where, you know, you, we know that setting intentions, setting goals engages prefrontal cortex. And in a prospective memory task, you've got to maintain those goals over an extended period of time while there's various other distractions happening. Um, and we wanted to contrast social and non-social prospective memory. As a social um, example might be little red riding who's remembering to stop at grandma's or remembering to do something that's related to another person compared to remembering to do a non-social thing like buy the milk. And are there slightly different brain systems for those or the different prioritization? Again, so um, prospective memory has been studied in traditional MRI studies, but it's pretty hard to find a task that is meaningful. You can have things like um, you see numbers come up and you've got to press a key for the larger number, but if both numbers are even, then you do a different task. So you sort of have overlapping tasks. 
And typically there'll be kind of an ongoing task that happens every trial. And then sometimes you've got to detect that there's a rare task. But again, you know, there's not much ecological validity to that MRI um, scanner situation. So what we were doing with um, Paul Burgess, who's really the expert on prefrontal cortex here, is um, setting up a study that takes place outside in Queen Square in London. Our participants are wearing a um, wearable um, FNA system that gives us 18 channels across prefrontal cortex. And they're walking around Queen Square, um, which um, our building is here in ICN. So we started um, all of our trials here. And we essentially have a circuit around the square that participants have to walk. And as they walk that circuit, they walk the circuit um, five times and they have to do a different task each time they go around. Um, the task would be things like count the number of buildings with the word queen on. There's a lot because it's queen square or count the number of buildings with steps up to the door um, and this kind of thing. So they're having to focus quite a lot on their environment. And because this is outdoors, there's always stuff happening. There's cars going past, people in wheelchairs getting in and out, you know, general obstacles of everyday life. They've also, in two blocks of the task, got this prospective memory task. So the social task was that we had a confederate who would stand at specific locations around the square. And when they see this particular confederate, they've got to come and fist bump her. Um, so she starts off here. And then when she's been fist bumped here, she runs around and pops up again here and then pops up here. So she can move from location to location without being seen too, obviously. And then the matched non-social task is to come and fist bump the parking meters, which Camden Council conveniently places all around Queen Square. And so again, there's parking meters here. And each time for these targets, you tended to have to cross the road and spot it kind of on the other side of the road, past a row of past parked cars. So we're giving participants a really rich, complicated environment and a lot of different things that they've got to think about in this task. And um, we're monitoring their prefrontal cortex, and then we can do your classic kind of analysis where we say what brain areas are engaged when you're doing um, the prospective memory task compared to just walking around the square without having a task and there's some stuff in prefrontal cortex and then what's the difference between the social prospective memory and the non-social and there's some stuff over here in the um, dorsolateral um, prefrontal cortex we lost unfortunately the channels on the other side so we can't really say whether this is bilateral or not but we can find you know, some nice stuff here that's concordant with what we've known from previous MRI studies. The thing that was very um, exploratory here was a secondary analysis where we chucked out everything that we normally do and say, well, most cognitive tasks, you take a brain, a um, task-based approach. So we know we've imposed on our participants a particular structure of the task. And then we say, what's the brain activity pattern look like? when you're doing that particular thing. But with this big, rich, complex data set, we said, well, let's also try a method devised by my colleague, Paola Pinti, um, where we look for a brain-first approach. We say, we've got this massive brain activity data, and just occasionally in that brain activity data, boom, there's something that lights up the whole of the brain. There's loads and loads of channels active. Something interesting is happening in that brain. And let's see if we can identify those function events and then we go back through our video footage and say, well, what was actually the real world correlate of this functional event that, that lit up a big chunk of the brain? So um, for this, we can take the EFNAS timeline and there's an algorithm called AID that I'm not gonna get into the detail of, but it basically identifies particular points in that EFNAS timeline that count as functional events where something interesting has happened, something interesting has engaged lots of brain, then we map those functional events and say, what was the participant doing at that time point? So for example, if we look at the functional events, we literally map them out over the space of Queen Square. This is again, the map of Queen Square. And these stars are the places where our um, Im important events happened, these targets that you had to go toward. And then the little colored dots are telling you when, where the person was physically located in the square, when a functional event happened. And we can see that some of these are clustering as our participant, um, they're walking this way around the square as they're approaching some here, for example, they're approaching this, they'll have seen that target and be ready to cross the road toward it. Or here on this side, again, we've got a big cluster of points as they're approaching the target. Um, and we can look 
again how this um, BA10, the more midline regions, have more functional events when you're in the prospect of memory blocks compared to um, some of these um, ongoing blocks when you haven't got the task. So we can sort of completely turn the traditional approach to analysis on its head. And um, this slide is kind of just a taster because my colleagues, Paul Burgess and James Crum are doing a whole lot more analysis on this data. But I think it, um, I just want to show you the potential for actually doing neuroimaging analysis a, a very different way around um, when you've got these sort of rich, complex real world data sets. Um, so just to summarize this study, we've shown that it is physically possible to collect data outside the lab in the real world. Um, you can use a block design where you're giving people different tasks and different blocks. Um, but we can also use this brain first analysis using an aid algorithm to actually identify functional events and then say what world of um, activities drove some particular functional thing that might be happening. Then the final study I want to tell you about is an even more quirky and exploratory one, which um, we did primarily as a public engagement project and because we had the opportunity to work with a fabulous um, group of actors who performed Shakespeare. But it actually really led me to think quite deeply about what's the relationship between things like neuroscience and the theatre, because in a neuroscience lab, we, we have specific roles, we have scripts, you know, we know that this is the experiment and this is the participant and for every participant who comes in a good experimenter will have a script that you go through as you do the consents and you explain what happens and you give the instructions and you check people's understanding at each stage and again the participant has an expected role that they will play that they will sit still at particular moments and um, be fairly obedient and this kind of thing and then again we'll then impose particular stimuli particular events on our participants and we want this to be reproducible to be able to do the same thing again and again. We see the same in some of the traditional social psychology experiments, these kind of things where you know you have a group of people who stand on a street corner in New York and everyone points upwards um, and you see how passers-by respond to that. That is in a way a piece of interactive theatre uh, that you're creating for your unwitting participants. And working with professional actors was a marvellous experience because what they're trained to do is do things that are repeatable every single night on stage. They can stand up and create Hamlet. Um, and it's also incredibly social and it creates this virtual world, almost like the virtual reality, but it has some deep emotional engagement, some deep imagination. So I think there's some really interesting things that when we're trying to kind of create real world neuroscience to, to actually work with actors and work with the kind of techniques that they found that work in the theatre. Um, now, what we were doing in this particular study is, again, we wanted to see if we can push ethnos to its limits and collect neuroimaging data from actors who are rehearsing Shakespeare. And the um, experimental condition we wanted to look at is, um, was to do with a sense of self and the idea that acting might change your sense of self when you go on stage every day and take on a particular role that, that somehow changes or maybe you suppress yourself. And we know that hearing your own name engages the medial prefrontal cortex. That's seen in fMRI, it's seen in infants, it's a pretty reproducible study. We wanted to see if that would also be seen in our actors. So we have six professional actors who are rehearsing scenes from Midsummer Night's Dream, and um, they would be rehearsing scenes where they're working in pairs. Um, we collected data from them over 19 different sessions, always with ethnos on two people. And so in each recording session, they have some control conditions where they might be walking or speaking, and then some acting sessions where they're either playing a scene with Cobweb or playing a scene with Titania. And throughout this whole session, um, the cognitive events we're looking at were name call events. So a speaker would literally shout out in my voice the name of one of the actors, Charlie! Um, and um, so Charlie obviously then feels a sense of self at that moment. His partner, Pepsi, who's acting with him, she, for her, it's the control condition because she's hearing a name, but it's not her name. And so then we can switch the names about and also have the names during both the um, acting blocks and during the control blocks. Um, and we can then use a fairly traditional analysis to say, what are the brain systems that are responding when you hear your own name, but you're not acting? And that was giving us the um, right DLPFC, 
what's here in your own name when you are acting. That was giving us the left DLPFC with a significant interaction between them. Unfortunately, we lost the medial channels, which, which were the ones we really wanted to get here, because by having people walking and freely moving about, this really is just pushing the limits of what you can get on this technology in terms of um, the amount of head motion and things like that. But again, I think this illustrates just a, a method that you can use to take quite an extended, fairly natural behavior from these actors and then impose some external events on and see how the brain is responding to having those external name call events imposed onto some other ongoing tasks. Um, so that's just a different way round of kind of, I guess, trying to find an experimental design that might allow us to get a brain, act brain activation changes when we're acting. Um, again, this is a novel data set with finding a whole bunch of different ways to analyze this also in relation to we have motion capture data, heart rate data, breathing data, all of these other things from these actors. So the, the, the summary of this um, study is that, you know, we can impose events on a very complex natural sequence um, and then that lets us kind of push this effortless technology to the limits of, of what it can do. And so I think I'm probably out of time and want to allow some time for questions. And I will finish there and thank all the people in my lab who worked on this. Thank you.